And so that sort of bridges the sermon last Sunday. If you didn't get a chance to hear it or you weren't with us, you might want to revisit it on our website, all of our sermons or uh, on our website, because last Sunday we were focusing on our calling in the workplace. Uh, Chuck Peng was telling us about her work with ASAR, and we were focusing on your calling, your vocation in the workplace marketplace. This week, we're going to look at the other side of your kingdom vocation, not just called into society, but also called to be part of the body of Christ. And I've entitled this sermon, Working Body Parts. Working Body Parts, not a car, but it's the body of Christ, working. Let's read together a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 following, that is speaking about the body of Christ. Here we go. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. And so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, sorry, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that all its parts should have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helping, guidance, and different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. That passage gives us a, a picture of Christ's body, the church, and that it is paralleled with a human body. Christ is the head of the church, and we're his body. That means that we're dependent upon the head for our direction. He is the brain, if you like. And he is the brain sending impulses into the rest of his body to move the hand and the arm and the leg and the body and, and to cause the will of the head to be expressed through movement in the body, speaking, listening, hearing. Jesus is the head of the body. And because we are his body, we are his agent in the world today. Because Jesus physically is not here today. Way back in the New Testament times, 
We have the Gospels, where Jesus was bodily, the Word made flesh. God came down, incarnate, in a baby, born in Bethlehem. The Word became flesh. God became human. And during those times where Jesus was with us on the earth, he was there in a physical body. He spoke, he blessed, he prayed, he ate, he moved, he traveled. His body was moving all the way around, doing the will of his Father. He says, I don't do anything, I don't say anything, but what my Father wants. So there he was, in a body, totally free to do what the Father wanted him to do. But then, after he was raised from the dead, he ascended on, to high, on high. And that's where Jesus is physically right now. That's where he physically is. The same body he was with on earth, glorified and at the right hand of the Father. That's why he sent his Holy Spirit. So Jesus in heaven is also with us here on earth by the Holy Spirit. And we, the passage says, have all drunk from the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is in us. Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, is in us. But it's more than just us being individuals with the presence of Christ in our bodies, the temple of the Holy Spirit. But we together are the body of Christ. I'll mention this later. There are two ways of looking at the body of Christ in the New Testament. We have the local church. The local church. We are one local church of many local churches in London. And each one of us are, a, a, are the body of Christ in a specific congregational way. But also we read in the New Testament that the body of Christ is global. That means all congregations and all believers put together all over the world are the present day body of Christ. And so Jesus is not here physically to go around praying for the sick, spreading the good news, teaching, making disciples. Uh, he, he's not here physically, but we are. We're here physically. He's the head in heaven, and by his spirit, his body has been multiplied. That's why he said it's better that I go. They said, don't go, Jesus. We like, we like to eat with you. We like to touch you. We like to hear your voice. We like to be around you. We've, we've been with you for three years. Don't go away. We're going to miss you. And Jesus is saying, it's better that I go away. Then I can be with everybody that believes in me. And then I can multiply my work. Not just me, Jesus, in a body for three and a half years ministering. But you become my body. You become my hands that, 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 that are laid on the sick and they shall recover. You become my voices across the nation, telling the good news of how God loves everyone and that I died for the sins of the world. And all that believe in me shall have eternal life and rise to glory on that last day. You go in, will multiply my ministry. What could only be done? in my physical body for three and a half years, in one location at one time, with people in my earshot. Some people even had to rip up a roof to get to me. We won't need to do that anymore because you will be my body. And I will send the signals. I will be the head and I will speak to you. So this is a very, very powerful picture the local body of Christ in the congregation, all the local congregations put together for the global body of Christ. We could say things like the body of Christ in London, meaning all Bible-believing churches and congregations together. We could say the, 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 the body of Christ in, in Britain if we wanted to, although the major distinction in Scripture is global and, and local. Now, think about this. Jesus is using... Uh, a direct metaphor about the local church and the global church. We're going to stick with the local at the moment. And he's saying, in this passage, you are a body. You're my body on the earth. I'm not physically there, but you're my body. And I am the head from which all signals come and direction come. So he's using a direct metaphor about 
us being the body of Christ. It, it, it's real. It's, it's, not, it, it's not just an example. Uh, it's not a simile. It's a metaphor. We are the body of Christ. We're not like the body of Christ. We're not similar to his body. We are the spiritual body of Christ. You've really got to catch this in your spirits today of who you are. And so, because all truth is parallel, we can take this picture of Jesus being the head and we, his literal spiritual body on earth, and we can say, well, what can we learn about the body? What about a healthy human body today? A healthy human body today. Uh, I hope that you're all in good health this morning. If not, at the end of the service, we'll have a prayer team here. We're more than happy to pray for you if you're struggling with any health issues. But those of us know that in order for us to live life to the full and do everything that we want to do, a healthy, responsive body is essential. Those of us that are struggling with, with health issues know that health issues can hinder you from uh, performing or, or living your optimum life, correct? It can hamper you. And it's true that even if one little part of the body is not working, it affects the whole body, which is what Paul was saying. So you can have one organ or, 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 or one gland or, 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 or one part of your... You can have a very bad ingrown toenail in your little toe and, you, and if it's bad it affects the whole body and so this teaches us that in the body of Christ we also need to have an equally healthy body for Christ to carry out his present ministry on earth I remember one day being in Durham Cathedral, one of my favorite places because that's where I gave my life to the Lord, just the f a few minutes before I went in next door to the theology department for my interview to do theology at Durham University. I'd just spent some time in the cathedral and it was there that I had a, um, I, I, I had a uh, encounter really with the Lord. I didn't quite understand it, but I responded to it. And so whenever we go to Durham, I like you to spend time in that place. It's a very spiritual place for me because of what's happened um, over the years there. And as I was walking around, I saw somebody in a wheelchair. And the person was sitting in a wheelchair, and do you know what? It looked just like Jesus. Now, when I say look just like Jesus, what I mean by that is sort of my cultural upbringing of what Jesus would look like, which is a little bit like Jesus Christ Superstar, you know, in, in the 70s. That, that's sort of my sort of like upbringing. I know it's not true, uh, uh, Jesus was Middle Eastern, but that's my sort of like, you know, uh, cultural upbringing. Jesus Christ Superstar, that's what Jesus looks like. And he looked just like the guy, uh, Ted Neely, out of Jesus Christ Superstar, just like him. But he was sitting in a wheelchair. And so I looked, at, I looked at him, without being rude, and there was no one around him, and I'm sure he could wheel himself, but he was just sitting there um, in the middle of the cathedral in his wheelchair. And as I looked at him, I felt prompted in my heart, I think it was the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, and I sort of heard in my heart a sort of like voice saying, this is my body of Christ in Great Britain today. That's what I heard, a quiet thing. This is my body of Christ. This is my body in, in, in Britain today. And I thought to myself, Jesus in a wheelchair? And it hit me. Now remember, this is symbolic, I, I believe, and prophetic, maybe. But Jesus in a wheelchair. I'm thinking, who's going to push him? Why can't he walk? Jesus in a wheelchair, and this is a picture of the body of Christ, the church in Britain today. And so I went on with the walk in the cathedral, this praying on my mind, and I left, and then I sort of like 
You know, being a charismatic Christian, as I left, I thought, maybe I should go back in. Maybe he won't be there anymore. Maybe it really was like you know, an angelic visitation. So I don't know whether it was or not. Probably not. You know what we charismatics are like. We always uh, want, want to make it even bigger than it is. But nevertheless, I went away and I began to think and pray about it. And I sort of thought, this is true. This is true. The legs weren't working. He was hampered in this picture. Jesus in a wheelchair. He was hampered. He couldn't do what I could do physically, this man in a wheelchair. Jesus in a wheelchair couldn't walk, couldn't run, couldn't jump, couldn't skip. Jesus in a wheelchair, extremely hampered. He would need ramps. He'd have to come through the back here in a manual, up the ramps to get into the auditorium to speak to us. Jesus in a wheelchair. It's a picture. It's an illustration that I believe God was dropping in my heart. And so thinking about the body of Christ, this has always stayed with me over the years, that is it possible for the body of Christ to be paralyzed because members of the body aren't functioning? Is it possible that a local church and therefore all local churches together, the global church, is it possible that Jesus might be in a wheelchair or on crutches? Is it possible that in some situations and some congregations today, could Jesus almost be paralyzed? Imagine being paralyzed. Maybe some of you have known people, family members or friends who ended up paralyzed from the neck down. Can you imagine? That must be horrible. Must be horrible. Can you imagine lying there and everything's all right in the head and your head is fine. You're, 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 not, you're not in a coma. You're, 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 your head is fine and working and, but you can't do anything because you're paralyzed from the neck down. And your head wants to do something. Your head wants to move. Your head wants to get out of bed. Your head has desires and it's, it's sending Ill impulses and commands. But the body is paralyzed and it's not receiving those commands. And what you want to do, you can't do because your body is totally paralyzed. Your body is not responding to what the head wants. These are powerful pictures. And I do believe they have something to say to us. Because this truth is parallel. Jesus is taking a human body and using it as a metaphor for a spiritual body. We read in this passage that each one of us are part of the body of Christ. Whether you like it or not, if you're a Christian, God has placed you in the body of Christ. You have a part to play. You have a part to play. You're a finger, you're a thumb, you're an eye, you're a tongue, you're a foot, you're a knee, you're an elbow, you're a shoulder. You're one of these things. You have a part to play in the local body of Christ. And in Corinthians, Paul was speaking to a local body of Christ. He was speaking to the body of Christ or church in Corinth. And they were all over the place as a body. They weren't united in love. They weren't united in preferring one another. In fact, the body of Christ was in, in Corinth was literally the eye saying, I'm the eye and I'm better than everybody else. And it was like, no, I'm the finger, I'm the hand, I'm better than everybody. I'm the most important part of the body. If you didn't have me, you wouldn't be able to grasp things. And the legs say, I'm the most important part of the body and the mouth saying I'm the most important part of the body because I'm the bit that speaks and preaches and the brain saying well no no, no that's not quite because right, Jesus said anyway it's breaking down it's breaking down but the problem was they were fighting in the body who was most in, the most important person in the church who had the greatest gift who had the biggest prominence and everybody wanted prominence everybody wanted to be seen as the most important person in the body of Christ in Corinth. And that's why there was so much um, difficulty over the gifts of the Spirit. 
People saying, I prefer this preacher, I prefer that leader, I'm, I'm after Paul, well, I'm after Peter, well, I'm after Apollo. All of this infighting in the body of, in the body of Christ. And Paul had to address that with love and honor. And even in this passage, he said, you know what? Just because you have a prominent role in the body of Christ locally doesn't make you any more important to the body of Christ as someone that is behind the scenes, you know? Somebody that gets the coffee and the tea and the biscuits ready for fellowship before you've even entered church and then having got it already uh, is no longer seen going off and doing something else. And you don't even perhaps know who set up the coffee and tea today on the rota, but you enjoy the coffee and tea. And then someone who you know whose name is, Bruce or Pastor Peter, who is going to be videoed and, and put on our website and et cetera, et cetera, who's going to have your attention for a number of of, of minutes and you're going to be hopefully not falling asleep but focusing on them. And there's a focus on me right now, you see. And the danger is, is that we think that somehow the focus and the spotlights that are on me make me more important in the body of Christ than somebody else. Absolute nonsense. That's Corinthian heresy and human fleshly thinking. We're all part of the body of Christ. But also, we're all different. That's the beautiful thing. There's things that I can do that you can't, but there's things that you can't, you can do that I can't. There's gifts and characteristics that God has given to you, gifts to play, we heard today, gifts to sing, gifts to serve, gifts to encourage, gifts to counsel, gifts to organize, gifts to pray, all sorts of manner of gifts, both naturally given by the Holy Spirit to you, you're you're good at maths, you're an accountant, please come and help us sort our accounts out. you see what I mean? God has given you natural gifts, he's giving you natural positive characteristics that makes you a unique individual in the body of Christ. You're a finger or you're a thumb, but although you're unique, you're part of a whole. And if you don't find your functioning part in the local body of Christ, then it means that we don't have a hand. That's, we, have to, we have to work without a hand. A hand's paralyzed. We can't do what God's called us to do without you. And so depending on people finding their place in the local body of Christ, that depends on how free Jesus is to fulfill his destiny in calling upon a particular local church. And in fact, local churches are different. And that's good. That's good. Bible-believing churches will have different emphases. First Wednesday of every month, when we're able, Pastor Peter and myself, we join with other Bible-believing church leaders in Westminster from different churches. We've got Westminster Central Hall. We've got Westminster Chapel. We, we've got um, Kingdom Faith next door. We've got... Uh, two Church of England's that meet. We're all Bible-believing leaders. And we meet together for a prayer breakfast once a month. And we talk about our different ministries and our personal lives. And we pray for one another. And it really is wonderful fellowship because although we're all preaching the good news, we're doing it in different ways, in different manners. We have strengths in Emmanuel. Uh, other, other, St. James the Less has different strengths in what he's, what they're doing. Uh, Westminster Central Hall has different strengths in what, do, what they're doing. And we don't fight about who's doing it right, because we all love the Lord, we all believe the Bible's authoritative, and we all want to reach the lost. And then we're doing it as God leads us. But we rejoice in the differences of the churches. We rejoice in what they're doing that we're not doing, and vice versa, because we know that although it's just a sample of churches in Westminster, together we're making an impact for Jesus in Westminster and London. And so that's a wonderful thing to do. So that's a church level, but it's the same with you and I. You have gifts, you have abilities, you have characteristics 
that are essential for us in Emmanuel Church. And where do you start? You start where you can. So not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, we have what we call Service Sunday. And what will happen in the upper hall is we'll have a number of tables with different parts of the ministry and service there. And anyone that's not already plugged in can come and speak and find out about different ministries to serve. Of course, as Chuck Penn said earlier, one of the most important parts to plug in to your local body of Christ is what we call a life group. In fact, technically, and it was only recently we changed the name to life group to make it more understandable to those outside, we called them cell groups. And as Pastor Peter said, we are a cell church. Well, where do cells come from? Not like some lady asked me once. She said, how come you, you talk about having cells? It sounds like a prison ministry. And I said, no, not cells in a prison. I said, cells in a body. Cells in a body. And the reason that uh, Bible-believing churches have used the idea of cell groups is the idea that a body is made up of different organs, and, but basically cells. Cells. Cells are the basis of a healthy body. Healthy cells, healthy organs, healthy body. Cells. And what are these? It's, it's the, it's the um, smallest form of effective church. What is the smallest form of effective church? When two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. It's the smallest element in the body of Christ. Of church. So we encourage you to find your life group. We, we, what we really are encouraging people as well is it's time for some of you to become life group leaders, life group assistants, and spiritual parents. We desperately need, in the coming months and year, people to step up in life groups and say, I've got more of a part to play now in this body, and my life group leader agrees, and I want to go and help multiply our life groups so that we can multiply our surface area of ministry allow more people to be involved in the ministry and out of their life groups to find their, their, their ministry. Whatever you can do, you, you've got something. Don't say, I don't have something for the local church. No, you do. And if you don't know what to do and you're at sixes and sevens, come and speak to us. Come and speak to the pastors. Come and tell us and we can help you plug in and begin to discover your part in the body of Christ. And that part can change over times. So it might be on our service Sunday, for example, that you've been involved in one type of ministry for, for quite a while, and you're wondering, do I have to stay here forever? No, you heard Chuck Peng. She was involved in many ministries in the church. She did the, she did the children. Not, it's not once a children's worker, always a children's worker. Although historically in churches, once you get to help the children, it's very hard to get out because we, <laughs> we can't find others to do it. But nevertheless, nevertheless, Chuck, found, Chuck Penn served and then found a way out and someone filled it. So it's fine. It's discovering in the body of Christ where God wants you at any given time because we don't want to, we don't want, we don't want, on this I finish, we don't want Jesus in a wheelchair, in a manual evangelical church. We want Jesus uh, to have a flexible, responsive body in all areas. We're not asking you to serve in all areas. We're asking you to find your place. Find your place. And when you find your place, however small it might be to begin with, remember, the passage says, the small gets the highest honor. And the so-called highest, well, let, let, let's, let's not make too much fuss about who's preaching every Sunday or whether it was a good, good or not sermon. It has to be effective. But let's not put any pastors on a pedestal. I know you don't, but let's not do it. But instead, let's recognize the little things that people are also doing and encourage them because that's where it starts. All right, I was going to end, but I'm going to do one illustration. I remember 
senior pastor of Kensington Temple called Colin Dye. We had him for our Easter conference. And I served with him for 30 years. Uh, and um, he began his ministry, and he would test, he began his ministry when he was at Kensington Temple. And he just looked at what to do, and he thought, well, what shall I do here? He was new. He knew. He was new. And he noticed that in those days they had red redemption hymn books. They didn't even have uh, overhead projectors. And he noticed that at the end, people would just leave their red hymn books on. So what he did is he decided that every week he would make sure that he picked up the red hymn books. And he did. And he says that was the beginning of his ministry. And it was. And then he grew hundreds of churches, an apostle to the nations. And there's something in that, not that I'm asking you to pick up the hymn books that we don't have, but it's the sort of sense that don't think it's too beneath you to do something. You might be massive in global economies. You might be Chuck Penn, global executive director of everything. You might be up there. But, you know, in the church, just begin to serve. Find something. Ask opinions. Father, as we close today, we are thinking and meditating about the fact that we are all bivocational. We have a calling in society. But we also have a calling to find our place in the body of Christ, the local body of Christ, so that you may not be paralyzed or hindered in any way for your work through our bodies on the earth. And Lord, may, may all the Bible-believing congregations in the world, may they all become fully active and fully functioning so that also on a global level, all of the congregations together, all of them functioning local bodies, also making your global body functioning so that your kingdom would come your will would be done. You would return to a beautiful, mature bride of Christ, your body here on earth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.